You guys good? Yep. It's coming through the net. Awesome. All right. Hello, everyone. How are you? You awake? Awake. Coffee. You got coffee? Morning tea? Something like that. Um, all right. So what we're going to be doing is running through the new build system. Um, out of curiosity, just before I go too far, how many have played with the new build system? Kind of none. Kind of none, excellent. Oh, one at the back. Well, thank you for your support. Um, <laughs> all right, so introductions, I'm Richard. Um, I tweet there, I have a site, I do stuff. Uh, Visual Studio LM MVP, uh, general pain in the butt, all that sort of thing. Um, but you don't really care about me. What you care about is the content of the talk, so I'm just gonna move straight on. Um, and here's what we're gonna run through. We're gonna go through uh, the how and why of team build, why there's a new uh, thing, and I hit the button twice, I didn't mean to do that. Um, we're also going to look at custom tasks, how we extend the build, add new tasks to the build. And then we're going to look at uh, a thing called SonarCube and how we can do integration of our build to SonarCube so we can track technical debt across builds and hopefully keep on top of our technical debt, uh, avoid it getting worse, and if anything, even during pull requests and stuff, monitor that so that we don't go backwards in terms of our code quality and maintainability, which is kind of cool. Um, I actually like that a lot. Uh, so the why. The why of team build. Um, I'm a little bit echoey, by the way. Um, there were some gaps in the old build system. Who, you've used the old build system, workflow, Windows workflow based, all that sort of thing. Have you ever tried customizing that, by the way? And you're still alive? So that's good. Um, so there were some gaps, there were some questions. You might have had some of these questions. Anyone, any of these seem familiar to you guys at all? Cross-platform, anyone tried doing cross-platform before? I actually did, uh, believe it or not, tried doing Linux builds in the workflow system by using remote PowerShell and SSH and other things. And um, to say it was painful, it's probably an understatement. Um, or the you know things like why do I need a current version of Visual Studio just to build a definite change a build definition? It's like what the um, where do I set logs? How do I put coverage in there? <laughs> Have you seen a XAML definition? Anyone opened one up and opened it up and then kept opening it up and kept opening it up and then opening it up a bit more and open up a bit more and you get the idea. Um, keep your build agents up to date. All those things and of course the main question. Uh huh. So why is Team City so popular, by the way? Exactly. It's just a task runner. You just kick it in, you set the task up, you do your thing, it just works. Um, so Microsoft saw that and they went, you know what? This really isn't working for us. We're going to go back to the drawing board. We're going to take the lessons that we've learned from looking at what the competition's doing and we're going to kill the old build definitions and the build approach and introduce a new build approach that is effectively like Team City in some respects. It's not a direct clone, obviously, but so those concepts of how do I just do task running and go from there. Um, the mechanism itself is then what they end up using for the release management. So who's played with release management as well now? Anyone? So release pipelines, right? A CI, CD pipeline these days is effectively just a sequence of tasks that get executed. Um, team build is the build part of that, the continuous integration part, and the release management is the deployment part. They work on the same approach. You have some tasks, you run them, you put them in an order, step, step, step. Fairly straightforward. Um, so the new build system, as you can see, now has a whole bunch of these different tasks. We have you know, Android builds, Xcode builds, we've got um, shell scripts and command scripts and everything else. No more XAML, yes. Um, no dependencies on MS build. Um, genuinely cross-platform. These tasks will run either PowerShell jobs or Node jobs on the various platforms. So Windows, you're generally looking at PowerShell and on uh, Linux and Mac OS and all that sort of stuff, we're looking at Node.js. Um, and we just go from there. So quick run through of the build system. For those who haven't seen it before, I'm just gonna jump over here. Here's our build view. So this is a VSTS hosted project. Um, you'll see this is slightly different than what you'd be used to. You'd be, you put my teeth back in. You'd be used to probably the build explorer view, which is this view here. Let's go, go Wi-Fi. There we go. Come on phone, you can do it. 
um, with our list of builds and everything else. And you go into Visual Studio, you see the Build Explorer, et cetera, et cetera. What we're seeing now is uh, probably a more, let's go, um, a more dashboard-based view of things. So these are the builds that I've personally triggered. So they come up under my list. But I could look at all the definitions, and I could look at the old XAML builds as well. So VSTS still supports those old ones. Um, and I can see these builds have happened, the continuous integration build, an admin project, a GitHub build. Yes, I can build GitHub code in VSTS, which is cool. Um, and I can see the, the success rate of these things, how they've been going. Is this build healthy? Is it having problems? Um, all that sort of stuff. The usual things, if I want to trigger one of these, I simply go and queue a new build, as you do. And I will just hit the magic button, hit OK. And we now go into uh, the build view, which is going to be executing the various steps that I've set up. <laughs> and the joys of doing this on slow network. I think the fact that we're inside a big concrete box is slowing down my 4G connection a little bit. Um, so you can see here it's doing the run. And we're going to now see the live console. So if you haven't seen this before, this is kind of cool. I'm actually getting logs straight off the build server. This is the hosted build controller. And we're getting a live feed of what it's doing. So we're restoring the NuGet packages. We're doing whatever else it is that we need to do um, or that we've got the build configured to do which is great. So I'm going to let that run. That will finish. We'll have a look at the build log in a minute. Uh, if I go back to the build definition itself and edit it, so here I've got uh, a specific build, the summary of what's been happening. We can see um, the various history of this build. Over the last nine builds, they've all been successful, for example. So we're getting these dashboarding views of our build health. Uh, I'm going to go hit edit. And we can see then the steps. Um, any second now, did I actually click it? There we go. Little spinner spins. And, 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 <laughs> and uh, there's my steps. OK, now I'm not going to bother clicking a plus because I'm sure you know how to hit it plus to add a step. Um, but the key with all these steps is they have parameters to them. Um, these parameters are grouped in terms of building custom tasks later. We'll show you how to do some of that. Um, variables, as, per, as before, dollar variable name in a bracket. Um, those variables come from the variables for the build. These can be overridden at queue time. So I could say I don't want to build the debug and release one. I want to build just debug, for example. I could change that. Um, we have the usual things like the repository to connect to. So this is a Git repository on VSTS, but I could quite easily talk to GitHub or an external Git provider like a, um, a Bitbucket if I use them, uh, or Subversion builds even. Uh, TFVC as well, all that sort of stuff is in there. Uh, and I can then pick that up and, and compile it. You'll note here this little flag, report build status. This is kind of cool. What this does, this puts a little icon here in, my, in uh, the code view that says, what's the state of the build for this branch? So if I hit F5 while this build's running, I should see that it's pending because there's a build currently in progress. And when that succeeds, I get the little green tick. If it fails, I get the big red X that says I suck. Um, and as a dev, being able to jump in and see the health of a branch is good. If I go to a different branch, which doesn't have a build attached to it, I won't have a little indicator sitting over here. OK, so it's not going to show me uh, the health of code that's not currently under build, which is good. So that's still pending. Um, I also have, uh, in general, there's this thing, badge enabled, which is a similar concept. But let's say I'm doing a GitHub build. So I have this same code over here in GitHub. And you can see that this build has failed. The little build things, you've seen these on GitHub projects, I'm sure. This is a really easy way to get one of those in there. You simply turn on the flag. It gives you a URL. You pop that into your markdown file on GitHub, and then it just renders the current state of the build, which is like, nice, nice. Um, or you could put it into your wiki, for example, as well. Let's say you've got an internal wiki or something like that that renders markdown or just renders images because it's just an image. 
um, you can put that somewhere and have the current build status sitting there all the time. So you've got these badges that show the current state of the build, which is cool. Um, you'll see other things in here. So on the general tab there, um, you can see that we have demands. This build has, based on the steps that it has, has certain demands on the build agent that it's going to run on. It says, I need to be a machine that has MS Build on it, Visual Studio and VSTS. If I was doing Xcode, I'd want something that supports that, or if I have to do NPM, or if I have to do, you know, Gradle, or whatever else, these are going to be different demands. And these are picked up by the agents, which we'll look at soon. Um, and the other thing just to be aware of is there's history. So every time I change these builds, I now have version control build definitions, which you don't have with the XAML builds. So when you change the build and the build suddenly broke, you don't know who changed it, what you changed, and inside a workflow definition, if you change one thing and you get it wrong, hey, it's, it's not much fun. Um, and as you would expect, you know, triggers and all those sort of things as before. Um, key thing to note that you can do path filtering. So while you can do a trigger on uh, a Git branch, you can also filter down on that. So if the branch is checked in, but you're only interested in a folder three levels deep or something like that, because you've got maybe artifacts and you don't care about them or whatever else, then you can filter your builds, get a little bit more specific about what's going on. All right, so that build hopefully is uh, ticking along. Let's have a quick look at the summary, jump back to the summary view, and no builds queued. That build succeeded the one we triggered before, so we'll just have a quick look at the summary view, which is nice. I like this view. So there's my builds, there's the steps that occurred. Uh, the build was successful, and I now have a view as to what's going on. So you can see, see that there, a little animation as well, just for fun. If it's got an animation, it's got to be good. Uh, <laughs> so this build has a whole four tests, it's massive. Obviously it's got huge coverage. Um, but at least they pass, hey? Um, and I could see code coverage if I had it turned on. I can see uh, any information, any warnings coming out of the build. If I had a deployment tagged onto this, I could create a release. So this links through to release management so I can see which builds have been pushed to which environments, which is good so we get that full CI CD pipeline going on. I'm not going to deal with release today too much, um, other than the occasional mention. Uh, work items, change sets, etc. We also have, because I'm running tests, we can have these extra views. So this is the test hub, or the test tab, I should say, in the build results and the summary. If you write your own custom tasks, you might want a different view in here using information that's been recorded. You can extend these views. You can add your own tasks, tabs, own tabs into the summary here without a problem through extensions. So if you, I don't know what you might be doing, but if you want to do something around that, you could put it in there without a problem. So that's how this is actually implemented. The test tab here is actually an extension. Richard, yes. Is this on the test tab, are any of the tests natively supported by that tab? Yep. Okay, great. Whatever you like. NUnit's just another task. Or running, it's the VS test runner, right? So NUnit, because it's supported by VS test, just run it through that, away you go. Uh, if you want to do JUnit tests or something like that, let's say you had some Java code, um, you can push those in as well. So the, the JUnit task will do whatever it needs to to push stuff in. Um, and here at the moment, it's only showing failed ones. If I switch this over to past, you'll see there's my ta uh, tests, etc. So I've got those different views of what's going on. Nice. Um, all right, so that's the build. Fairly straightforward in terms of executing, running them, adding tasks, and so forth. It's nice. It's nice. Um, to support this, the team made some architectural changes that are important to know if you're coming from the old one through to the new one or just in general. So firstly, the old build system required a controller. So if you had an on-premise TFS server, you'd have to run a controller, which then talked to agents. And so a build would trigger, it would pass a message to the controller, the controller would figure out which agent to run it on and handle all that for you. The controller's gone. No separate controller process, which is great. Um, it turns out that agents now register directly with the deployment level thing, which basically means your on-premise TFS server or VSTS at the account level. 
So that's what we're talking about when we say deployment level. Um, and the collections talk to those. Agents themselves are pooled. So you don't directly address an agent, you address an agent pool. And agents register themselves in a pool. And then we go from there. Um, and the good thing with those agents is once they're installed, they actually update themselves automatically. So you don't have to worry about keeping these things up to date as new versions occur or are released. They simply go and grab themselves, self-update, restart themselves. Very nice. So from a management perspective, really easy. So if you end up running a large build farm, um, that's really important. And Microsoft I have dog fooded a lot of this themselves. Um, they run... A, couple of hundred build servers. Managing all those was a bit painful for them, so they fixed the pain. Um, I don't know how many build agents or servers you run, but I don't run 100. I don't run even 10 normally. Um, most people will run one and maybe one agent. Um, but architecturally, what we see now is this, that agents are doing the work. Agents execute tasks. Those Tasks get downloaded to the agents and run from there. As you version or update those tasks, they'll come down automatically. Um, and those agents will either do build tasks or release tasks. It's not a problem. They're just agents. They execute things. Um, the agents get pulled, as I mentioned. And in a team project collection, we create queues that point to those pools. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping of a queue within a team project collection to an agent pool. Um, and then the jobs that execute, whether it's a build job or a release job, simply run in those queues. And they get queued up and executed, and away we go. Nice. Um, turns out that the agents themselves, there's actually, actually two versions at this point in time. The original versions were a .NET version running on Windows and a Node.js version running cross-platform, so running on the Mac or the Linux boxes. Um, they still exist, they're still usable, no problem at all. However, with .NET Core coming out, the team's done the smart thing, consolidated the code, and now has a .NET Core-based build agent. So the one code will run across all, th you know, all the different platforms. Um, so it makes it much easier for the team to maintain. It also makes it much easier for us deploying things to go, well, I don't care what version, I'm just going to take the agent and push it to the machine. Away we go. So we'll see that in a second as well. Um, a few other things to be aware of. There were some security gaps in the old system, the old approach. So each build now runs in its own separate process. That means if you've ever had the situation where a build is hung and locked files and you've had to log onto the build server and try and release the files and you've done this, just me, it's just me. Um, <laughs> that's not there anymore. If a build hangs and you kill it, because it's out of process, those, that process disappears, the locks get released, end of story. Happy days. Um, each build is also now given a time and scope limited access token. So previously the build would run under uh, full permissions, that doesn't happen anymore. So that means a naughty developer doesn't get to write a unit task that executes something and does something evil on the TFS box or the VSTS account, um, and we now have restrictions around that. Not that that would ever happen, right? Never happens. No devs ever do naughty things. Um, where's Troy's talk? <laughs> All right, so let's have a look at agents very quickly. Um, so the idea with agents, if I go into uh, admin over here to start off with. All right, and I go to agent queues you will see that in this particular team project, I have a queue, two queues. Uh, one of them is pointing to the hosted build controller or the build services, so a hosted agent. And the other one is my, what I called the creatively named default queue for my, <laughs> my on-premise build server, which is actually my laptop. Um, actually, not this one. This is a VM. Never mind. Different setup. Doesn't matter. It's a machine. Um, the default queue has two agents in it creatively named RB build and RB build 2. Um, and you can see what's happened. The, each agent we can see has run, that run has run two builds, this one's run three. The hosted one where I normally run things has run a lot more. The hosted agent green, it's currently available. At the moment, my default queue has no available agents, they're both stopped. We will fix that in a second. 
You'll see here, if I want to set up a new agent, I simply download the software. I hit download. And you'll see now we have Windows OS X and Linux, and we have Windows Legacy. This is the old .NET one. That's the bring it down, install it. This is now the new .NET Core stuff. So to download it, you can either just download it yourself or you can use a little bit of PowerShell. This is simply doing uh, a zip. So you can see it says zip file there, extracts it to the current directory, PWD, current working directory. Um, and then we run config and run. Config simply connects it up to the, your uh, deployment. So your TFS server or your VSTS account. Um, Connect that up using a personal access token. Have you seen these, by the way? Personal access tokens? No? Nope. OK, so very quickly, uh, let me just go here. I'll just under here. If you go security under your account, you'll see these personal access tokens. I've created one for this agent, for example. This creates a one-time key. You've got to copy it down and remember it, because after that, the UI never shows it. Um, and then you can use that token to connect up your agent. So if you change your password, the token stays the same and your agent doesn't suddenly stop. <laughs> Always handy. You've never had that problem, right? Someone has an account, password, someone changes it. Oops, everything broke. Never happens, never. Um, these keys themselves have scope restrictions on them. The only one you need for an agent is this one here that says agent pools. That's it. So I don't need to give my agent permissions to do um, code, load tests, <laughs> extension data, I don't know, whatever else, manage projects, push stuff to the team room. <laughs> it doesn't need any of that stuff. Um, I just need to have a token that says do that, and this is valid for a year. Once it's expired, if I want to fix that, I jump in here and I hit refresh, or I change it to expires in a year, and Whatever else, we go from there. Um, so that does probably bring up a short question, which is, should I run my uh, builds under my user account or someone else's? Trick question, right? Still create a service account for these things. Don't run it under your own. Because um, it will show up in uh, the builds. You'll see it in the logs. Um, anyway, so we download the agent. If I'm running on uh, Linux, for example, it's exactly the same deal. I download it. Uh, we use tar in this case to unzip it. Um, and based on the screen res, uh, we do config again and we run it. So you can see there's Ubuntu 16, Red Hat 7, whatever else. They're all the .NET Core supported platforms at this point in time. I would expect as .NET Core improves over time that that will extend. I'm sure you can try running it on something else like Gentoo or whatever else. I just don't know if it's supported, that's all. Um, all good? So, I have one here I've prepared earlier. Woohoo, look at that screen res, isn't that beautiful? Um, that's a 4K display getting mucked up. Um, but you should be able to see here, uh, this is the agent. I've done the config already, I won't go through that again. I'm just simply going to do run.command, which is going to start the agent. As you can see, it's going to say, I'm listening for jobs. Um, so it's currently doing a scan of the machine to check the capabilities, and it will report that in the agent. And then that's used by then uh, VSTS to figure out what to push. So if I go to my agent here and just hit refresh on this page, you'll see that RB Build 2 is now an active agent. It should be green. There it is, because the agent has connected. It's got a current status. Um, and the capabilities in here are simply a list of key value pairs. So this says, uh, you know, here's my capability. I can run MS build, for example. I can run down the bottom VS test, for example. So I have that capability. If I wanted to query the specific version of VS TS or the path or whatever the value happens to be, I can do that in my build as well. OK, so this is how you configure agents. Get them up and running. It's very straightforward, nice and easy to deploy. Um, and can then run anywhere. So if you want to do your Mac builds or you need to do iOS development, whatever else, you simply take your agent, you put it on a local Mac, because you have to compile, obviously, on those things, hook it up to your VSTS instance, and job done. You've got yourself a build server ready to go. All right. So moving through, extensibility. 
I've now got a build, I can run steps, I've got agents I can deploy to. I now wanna do something a little unusual because hey, I'm me and I've always got something special I need to do. Um, so what's the approach? The general approach to extending a build and doing things that aren't in the normal step is, and is probably the preferred approach, is to run scripts. Scripts don't require you to build your own custom tasks, deploy them or anything like that. You simply take a command script or a shell script or whatever else, put that as a task in your build step and execute it. End of story. Um, and nine times out of 10, that will be sufficient. Probably 95 times out of 100, to be honest. Um, where you wanna think about custom tasks are where you're taking the same script and you're applying it to multiple builds multiple build definitions all doing exactly the same thing and you can parameterize that, whatever else. You might think about doing it that way. Um, or you've got an overly complex set of things that you're doing and you wanna do something around that, make it a little easier to manage. Um, or you're doing custom actions or whatever else it is that you wanna do. There are reasons to do that. What you should think about, Sorry, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. it's just a script. It's going to be running a script that's from source control. Yeah, okay. So as long as it's in source control, you just point to the path, away you go. Um, the thing to remember with any custom uh, task is it's simply a tool runner. It's going to run some sort of executable on the machine to do a job. So we'll look at one um, in a little bit, but it, the Octopus Deploy one, we'll look at that one just for fun. It will run octo.exe. That's all it's gonna do. It's fairly straightforward. Um, and those tasks, as I mentioned, are either PowerShell or Node.js. And we use a thing called TFX CLI to do these things, to, to manage those tasks. So if I go back here for a second, very quickly, and as you can see, um, <laughs> screen res, come on, baby. Um, let's unzoom a little bit. That's probably too small, isn't it? That's good, how about that? All right, TFX is the thing that's been installed. To get this in, you simply, uh, you need to use Node. This is cross-platform, so this is an NPM uh, thing. So you do NPM install dash G for global, TFX CLI, and it will turn up in your path, and you can simply run TFX everywhere. It's good because, as um, Mr. Hanselman was saying before, it's got ASCII art, so it's gotta be good. Uh, <laughs> And I simply go TFX build, and I can do dash dash help to see what my options are. And I can either queue a new build, I can list things, I can show tasks, I can do whatever it is. So I did before task list, which shows the existing ones that are there, and you could see the octopus ones that had been loaded up. They're not part of the default install, I've actually added those. Um, and this is querying. So initially I did a TFX login, I used a personal access token to log in connect it up and then I can see these things. And if I wanted to get rid of one of these, I would do TFX tasks delete and then give it the task ID and it's gone. So this is how I'm managing custom tasks on my account, okay? To put a new one there, I do TFX tasks upload, build task upload, whatever. Um, and that will package up for me automatically a folder and send it up there with a manifest file and everything that you would expect. Um, so custom tasks are different to the, the summary extension, by the way. So build summaries, extending that with extra tabs or adding extra uh, visualizers is an extension. The build tasks themselves are custom tasks. They're separate pieces. So if you were putting together a component that showed um, build task and visualizations, you'd package that up as a uh, extension overall and deploy that. And you'll see that with the um, Octopus one. Common question that comes up, how do I say, if I've got multiple tasks, how do I get one task to create a value that I can pass on to the next task? You do that with a thing called logging commands. Logging commands to be genuinely cross-platform do something really simple and really simple. And it's really simple. And it's really kind of simple. Um, you simply take, because I said simple enough, double hash VSO, 
and you log this to the, con the console. The log monitor picks that up and goes, oh, I know how to parse that, and we'll read it. So if I wanted to set a variable, I do uh, double hash VSO task set variable, variable name equals test var, and then the value after that. And that will then become available in subsequent tasks as an environment variable. And then I can simply go dollar environment variable name and I can pick that up and read it <clears throat> if I was using PowerShell. Uh, if I'm using Node, I'm obviously doing something slightly different to read the environments, but same approach. One thing to avoid, a lot of tasks originally were setting environment variables themselves. If you do that, it won't get passed through because tasks themselves are executed out of process as well. So a build's executed out of process and the tasks within the build are executed out of process. So if you set an environment variable when the task finishes, that process goes away. The environment you set, it's gone. So you need to make sure you use it, uh, the, the logging commands. There are a whole bit, uh, bunch of others as well. So you can do things like reporting progress. So if you had a long running job and you wanted to report you know, every 10%, how my, how's my progress going? You can do that with a logging command as well. And the build agent picks that up and the build system reports on that, makes it uh, available and it's, it's cool. All right, so let's have a look at a custom task, shall we? Um, go away, you. So this is the Octopus build and release tasks. If I want to install those in my account or on my TFS server, I can either download and just hit install. That's going to create all the various tasks for me. Nice thing is you can look at this code because it's online. So here's Octo TFS. This is all the source we need. So this has information about deploying it, packaging these things up, putting in the tasks. So if I jump into source here, um, we can see uh, extensions and tasks. And I can come into tasks and we've got some common things. We've got deployment tasks, pack tasks, so Octopack. Who's used Octopus? A couple of you. So I'm just going to have a look at this create Octopus release. And you can see this has a task JSON file. So this is effectively the manifest. This is the definition of what the task is. Um, and let me just go full screen. Oops, not GitHub desktop. No. All right. Um, what have we got here? We've got a name. It's a well-described JSON document, effectively. Um, versioning information, uh, the category this is set in, whatever else, and it can be build or deploy. Um, what grouping I've got. Uh, so, and then uh, here, inputs, user inputs. Remember the parameters on the uh, right-hand side of the screen that we were looking at? So when you add a task, you've got parameters and variables you can set. This is where they're described. So they come in here, they're described um, with some help files on various things as well. So you can put little mark down and document things, so the little information icon that's there. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So yeah, it's a little bit adjacent. It looks a little clunky, but it's fairly descriptive and it's fairly easy to read and understand. It's just a matter of setting properties. Um, wrong key. All right, so if we go and have a look at the task itself, this is simply launching a PowerShell file. Remember, it's just a task runner. And if we look at the PowerShell file, you can see it's picking up things like the current repository provider, um, VSS endpoint, all these things that have been set. Uh, and you'll find, if I look for Octo, uh, that it's going to run Octopus down here. It's going to check the credentials, do whatever it needs to do, execute a whole bunch of things, and eventually calls octo.exe after it's set up whatever it needs to based on the properties that have been provided, and hits the magic button. That's as complex as it gets. Question? So is there any reason you're using Octopus? Like, you can normally just add a task or something in PowerShell. You can. That's the, that's the whole thing, right? If you just do this as a PowerShell script, that's perfectly fine. But you might want to make that easier to manage. You might want to make it more parameterized so that you don't forget what you were doing. Because I could just do in my um, build definition, let's just jump back in here and I'll show you. I could, if I want, 
uh, go edit, for example, and in my build steps, add a build step that simply says uh, execute PowerShell. Um, doo -doo -doo, it's going to be utility. Let's go there. Um, PowerShell. Yep. And I could add that. And I could go into here and I could put in the script path. And I could put in all the arguments. But that's a long set of arguments. And editing all those on this line here gets a little clunky because it's just not that much screen real estate. Um, or I could make it a little easier for myself and go and add instead. Uh, in, I'll just do it in all, wherever it is, create octopus release under C, create, where's the octopus? There it is, hello. Um, add that, and you can see here that this is all the extra information. So what's my project? And we've got you know, the help markdown. Um, and if I want, I can add deployment things. So I want to deploy this to, I've got additional options. Where's octo.exe actually live if it's not in the path? So all these things that, that I have, that it just makes it easier for me to do some of these things. So yes, scripting is definitely the preferred approach as a basic starting point. But when you want to get beyond that, it's not too hard to extend from here. Um, the good thing with this uh, is this is now bundled with a whole bunch of other tasks as well. So you can actually bundle these tasks together as a full extension and deploy that um, to your installation. So Octopus? Um, it depends who you know. <laughs> um, no, Octopus costs money. It's a commercial deployment product. Um, but the, the extension itself, to integrate to it from VSTS or TFS, that's a freebie. Um, they're not the only things. If you want to look at other tasks, all the Microsoft tasks that are in by default are actually provided online, the source to them all. So if you want to have a look at how uh, archiving worked, zip files, I can jump into the archive files task. And I can see that this has got some TypeScript in here where we're doing some, uh, Effectively, this will run under Node. So this is TypeScript gets compiled down, obviously. And then we've got things like where's the tar or the zip location or 7-zip or win7-zip and whatever else. And this will go through and execute the appropriate zip task on the appropriate platform. So if you're after inspiration on how to do something, definitely look at the task library here. Uh, and it's also got all the JSON files and everything else that you can look at on in terms of how do these things work. So extending VSTS, really easy. Uh, and a lot simpler than it used to be. All right, so moving back to uh, other things. So I wanted to talk about Sonar Cube. Um, so technical debt, or if you go to Doc Norton's session later this week, he's going to talk about technical debt versus what we commonly call cruft being just stuff we don't like in our code base. Um, well worth going to that session, by the way, if you want a you know, little bit of a tip. Um, I like keeping on top of things. I like to keep my code clean because I personally am a pretty crappy programmer. Um, I use tools to point out when I'm rubbish. They point it out regularly. Um, and I, I have generally relied in the past on things like you know, FX Cop and so forth to tell me where things are. Sonar Cube, if you haven't seen it before, is a really nice tool for, for tracking these things we don't like or the technical debt. You know, the question is like, is my code getting better or worse over time? Because FX Cop doesn't tell me that. It just says, at the moment, you suck by this much. But am I sucking less or am I sucking more? Um, or where are the hot spots I need to think about in my code? What should I target for refactoring and improvement? Where's my dead code that I should get rid of? Um, what are the problems I haven't spotted for myself, such as not disposing objects properly? Um, and even better, can I get that information during a pull request so that I can see that and fix my pull request so that I keep the, you know, the campsite cleaner than I found it, Boy Scout approach to code? So let's have a look. Sonar Cube and VSTS living together. So if you point your browsers, if you want to play along at home, to rbsonarcube.cloudup.net, I actually have a Sonar server running at this point in time. It's open. I don't, really don't care what you do to it. I can always just kill the VM and start it again. Um, 
But I have in here two different projects that are showing me what's going on. So here's a dashboard. Uh, it's showing me I currently have no bugs, but I have four vulnerabilities. What? No, I don't. Wait. Oh. Yes, I do. I have four things that are potentially vulnerabilities, and I can decide if these are good or not. Um, and I can have a look at my code. I can see what's going on. I can jump into it. Um, I can see other things that are going on, like, oh, really? Program should be static? Nah, doesn't need that. Um, or console write line, look at that. There's my logging statement, and I'm passing a literal, oh, really? Should I do that? I don't know. And I can decide if this is actually important or not. Um, I could decide that I can resolve this as I won't fix it. It's a known issue, I'm happy with it. Or, yep, it's a false positive, it's not really true, or I'm gonna fix it or whatever else. So this is a good way of keeping track of stuff. Who's run across SonarQ before? No one? Ooh, one person. Well, that's exciting. So welcome to the brave new world of how the rest of the, the non.net Microsoft universe works. A lot of these guys out there will pay attention to this stuff, especially Java and um, things like that. In fact, um, the way this whole thing works is there's a bunch of analyzers. This particular project that I'm looking at, I've only run the .NET analyzer on it. Um, if I go to my main dashboard and look at the micro cafe one, I'm actually running C sharp JavaScript and web analyzers on it. So I can pick up a bit more stuff. And it's also telling me here, you know, I've got no code smells, seven days worth of debt, 2% of my code is copy paste. If that number's above 50%, you're looking at an enterprise system. Um, <laughs> 5.2 thousand, so 5,200 lines of code. So you can tell this is a huge project, this particular one. Um, I can also see that I failed what's called a quality gate. So one of the things I can do with Sonar Cube is I can say, I have a certain level of quality that I want to check. If I don't meet that, I'm gonna fail the quality gate. That quality gate at the moment, if I click on it, says I should have no blocker issues. So the logic around these flags is kind of backwards, but basically it says if the blocker issues is greater than zero, then I'm failing the quality gate. Does that make sense? Okay, there's other ones like this one, which is says, you know, on new code, if the coverage is less than 80%, fail the quality gate. So we wanna make sure that, yeah, we don't have good coverage at the moment, but if I, if I write new code from this point forward, I wanna do better than I've done in the past. Um, or I want to make sure that over what we call the leak period, which is the last point in time we're checking to now, that I haven't had um, critical issues greater than zero. I could, so that means I could have old critical issues that are there and unknown, but I'm just making sure that I don't get worse from here. Make sense? So we can set these things up. How do I actually hook that into, hook this into VSTS? Good question, I'm glad you guys asked. It's kind of like the curiosity show, right? Um, so I'm gonna look at this build the app, build the app, oh. Don't you love it when that happens, by the way? The page refreshes before you're ready. One of the fun parts of JavaScript. Um, so if I go and edit this definition, there are two steps, two custom tasks that the, uh, that have been created by Microsoft to do the integration for you and make this really, really easy. Um, you will see down here SonarCube pre-build and SonarCube post-test, these two steps, or tasks, I should say. We simply include that. So this is the same build as before, effectively. It's just a CI build, and I've simply added this step first, which is the pre-step. What happens is I point to Sonar Cube um, endpoints, by the way, are just simply a way of making it easy to reference a URL or a service. So GitHub and Sonar Cube. Sonar Cube is here, and if I update the service configuration, you can see I've given it a URL, and I have a username and token that, uh, or password that I've entered previously. We don't see that again, obviously. Um, so that's how VSTS knows where to talk to. 
So I'm going to talk to my Sonar Cube server, and I'm going to say this build is related to Micro Cafe Dash Admin, which is the project. Oops, the project here that I was looking at. This one here. So that's the name of it. So that's how it knows where to put the metrics. Okay, so it needs to know where to publish the metrics if I've got multiple projects. And uh, other than that, there's my project name, version numbers, um, and I've got in here some advanced options. One of those advanced, op advanced options is to fail the build when the quality gate fails. That means if I fail the quality gate, this build is gonna go red. That's a good thing. That helps enforce that idea of, if the quality gates failed, break the build. Break the build. Because if I fail the quality gate and I just leave it sitting in Sonar Cube, guess what the devs do? Hey, just keep going. I don't look at Sonar Cube until it's broken and it tells me off. Um, we then do our build and test, and then we simply take at the end our results and we upload them. So this is just the aggregation step, and it pushes it up and does the final check and waits for the analysis to complete and checks the quality gate and so forth. All good? Nice and easy, such a simple integration. If you try doing this with um, Team City, it's a bit painful. Look at the docs on Team City on how to do it, and you're kind of left going, mm, it's how you get bald like this. Um, or you try putting it into Jenkins and Maven, whatever else. These things are a little bit more complex. This is the easiest integration I've seen for this stuff. Um, and if I build one of these, let's actually, well, I won't do a build at the moment because it takes time, but I can queue that build and we can have a look at the results. And you can see at times that the build has failed because I've been playing around with my quality gates which is what these ones are. Now you'll see also, possibly, if I just zoom that up a little bit, that I have builds of master, but I also have these other ones, seven, eight, and nine. These are pull request builds. If you've not come across this before, this is a really nice feature of, uh, of using Git in that I can go into um, my admins part here, and if I go to version control, I can have policies on my branches. So on the master branch, because that's gonna be my nice good code, I have set up what we call a branch policy that says when someone checks, uh, creates an update, <laughs> creates or updates a pull request that's meant to be going into the master branch, make sure I build this project with this particular build definition. So I'm gonna do it with the sonar build. What that's gonna do is it triggers the normal build process, but from a sonar perspective, it doesn't record the result. So that you can, you avoid having this incremental logging happening every time there's a pull request. It's, here's my last known good build, how does this compare to it? Did I go better or worse and foul the gate? And I've said block pull request completion unless there's a valid build. Nice, nice. So now I can go to code, and I can go to my pull requests like this, and uh, pick one of these, for example. And because there's a build attached to this, a policy, you can see the build failed. If I tried completing this pull request, sorry, build must succeed for you to update master, no luck, no dice, don't go messing up our beautiful master branch with your crappy code, Richard. Like seriously. Um, so I'm gonna just reevaluate this. Manual merge, oh really? All right, well, I'm not gonna do that. Um, that's what happens when you practice things and you put it in the wrong branch. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna be really naughty, really naughty, and I'm gonna go to master here and I'm gonna add a new branch on the fly. Okay, or whatever. Complete with typos, ignore that, they're not really there. And in my thing, I'm gonna jump into some admin code. I'm gonna to go to admin, service, program CS. And I'm gonna do what you should never do, which is edit directly in source control, right? Another new string. I'm gonna make this by Z or whatever else. Save that. That's created a commit which is cool, so now if I go into my pull requests, 
and I can go new pull request here, and it'll validate. I'm just gonna hit the magic button, and what will happen is I'll go to the pull request view. This is then gonna go and start a build automatically because of that policy. And if I have a look at the build over here, you'll see that this is gonna go through the normal process as we saw before, um, waits for an agent, starts running, we're going through the steps. Um, it's doing its thing, which is cool. Looking at a previous one, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, I can also see, uh, I think it was this one. I can look at some completed ones. If I pass the quality gate, but I still have some issues, um, what will happen, uh, was it this one? Not this one, let's go to a completed one. Completed. Sonar Cube, as it runs, if it picks up warnings or things like that, it can actually log it automatically into my pull request view. Uh-huh. So on my new code, hey, what, what? There's this unused variable, why? Why is that in here? Why? Why? Um, and I can then go through that as a dev, look in this pull request and go, yeah, you know what? That's kind of not good. Um, and we could have looked through that and made comments and fixed things up and and pushed in new code, fixed up our warning so that all our pull requests come through as clean all the time. So really nice. Uh, so I would encourage you to play around with that. Um, in terms of time, we're almost done. So just as a quick recap, um, we've gone through the why and the how of team build, why they build a new version other than the obvious, um, how the new bits work together, the basics of doing a build, what we need to do to customize tasks, and how we can do things like putting Sonar Cube into our build pipeline so that we can keep on top of technical debt and keep our quality high. And that's pretty much it. So I would ask you guys to go and play with this stuff yourself if you haven't yet done it. It's really easy to set up. It's not too complex. Probably the hardest part is getting a Sonar Cube server running. But again, if you're using Azure or something like that, you can probably find a VM image with it sitting on there already. Um, and then just go from there. Questions? Yep, that's fine. Uh, is there a similar story to all of those features you were showing with pull requests and things set up in integration? Uh, so you'd be looking at gated builds. So you'd have a gated build that runs okay. and get the gated build to do the sonar cube. Um, I haven't checked TFVC in a while in terms of the support, in terms of what's there or not. Um, that said, it shouldn't be too hard to find out. Okay. <laughs> Run a build, see what happens. Yeah. Um, obviously, for some of this stuff, uh, maybe not obviously, but for some of these features, especially um, the integration here, you will need the latest version of TFS on-prem, if that's what you're using. Uh, so put 2015 update three on. Yeah. Uh, generally with TFS, keep it up to date anyway. It's not a problem. Unless, of course, you've got the you know, ops department that says it's a production system and the only time you can update it is once a decade <laughs> when we have an outage window. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, other questions? Yep. Yes, they do. Yep. So the question was for the, the recording is that uh, build agents update themselves. So a build agent that was six months old, for example, will it automatically update itself to the .NET Core build agent? No. It will update itself to the latest version of the .NET agent or the Node agent. Um, the .NET agent, the V2 agent, isn't quite at feature parity with the, uh, or it wasn't two weeks ago anyway, with the, the old .NET agent, there was just some gaps. That said, the UI updated itself on the weekend. So I'd say that new agent's probably at feature parity now, so I'd have to check. Um, and I have to find out what happens with the old agents now that the new V2 is 
the main agent. So I'm not quite sure yet. I have to check. Yeah, so really easy to change an agent. Um, so I was on remote desktop before. This is the build server here. Uh, if I just kill that, for example. Um, to remove one, uh, simply do config. Uh, oi. Config, oh gosh, config.command remove. So that removes the old one. Um, and I would put in my auth type, make sure I've got permissions to remove it, obviously. And then just, it deregisters itself. Then I can just drop a new agent onto the same box. The agents themselves are simply small executables or small zip files. You unzip them into a folder, you run the config command, you're done. So it's a really simple process. It's not this whole uninstall, reinstall dance. It's just config remove, drop it in a new folder, whatever you want to do. So I've got this one in agent two. I also have another one in uh, C slash agent, which is that one there. That's the old one where you had to run configure agent and run. So they're slightly different. So other questions? Other than that, Thank you very much, guys. Um, go enjoy lunch. Enjoy the rest of the conference. I'll talk to you later.